It's just now 7 p.m. on Wednesday, October the 25th. And I want to welcome you all again to the fourth annual UCSB Natural Reserve System Fall Seminar Series. My name is Andrew Brooks, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's presentations. I want to encourage everyone to join us each Wednesday night at 7 p.m. and for the next three weeks as we virtually visit one of the UCSB Natural Reserves and showcase some of the truly incredible research and other activities taking place there. Before I kick off tonight's program, I would like to briefly go through a bit of housekeeping. The presentation portion of tonight's seminar will last approximately 45 to 50 minutes. We've set aside the remaining 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for any questions that you all might have for tonight's presenters. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little button labeled Q&A. You can click on that button and then type your questions into the text window. I'll be monitoring the questions during tonight's presentations, so please feel free to type in your questions at any time. With all that sorted, I would like to begin by introducing Mr. Keith Sedell, the director of the Kenneth F. Norris Rancho Marino Reserve. Keith will give us all a brief history of the reserve and discuss some of the exciting work that is taking place there. Keith will then introduce Jenna Bental, our featured speaker for the evening. And with that, take it away, Keith. Thank you, Andy. And let me share screen here. Our speaker this evening is um, one of our long-term visiting researchers. Um, she comes back year after year, and it's always a, a great time for me when she shows up because I always learn something. And that's a great thing. I, I, I enjoy my researchers that come in and uh, I always get to learn something new from them. And that's that's a, a beautiful thing. Keith that mentioned the trickiness of telling sea otters from bull kelp and i have to say that even though i've been doing this uh studying wild sea otters for over 20 years i'm still fooled by it and just about every other sea otter biologist will tell you the same so it's pretty amazing camouflage once they swim into a bed of nereocystis they pretty much disappear um, so I just want, really want to thank uh, Keith and Andy for hosting me tonight. The science stories and photographs associated with my time studying sea otters on the slow coast are vast. If I could, I'd include all of it uh, because it means so much to me. My time specifically at Rancho Marino, but also um, all along the slow coast is is has been a really great, important, resonating time for me. While I'm currently based in the Monterey Bay area, I still consider Slow County my home. And so I'm just going to be giving you a sampling of what we've learned from sea otters over the Slow Coast in the last two decades in the form of stories, especially of two representative sea otters. And there is a lot that I am skipping over, but perhaps if I can address the gaps in Q&A or I can refer you to some of the published science. So let's let's get started. Just gonna give you a quick table of contents. I'm gonna give you a short prologue, talk a little bit about Rancho Marino, although not as much as I would like to, tell you a tale of two sea otters living in the slow along the slow coast, talk about some threats from land to sea, and talk a little bit about awareness and our coexistence with sea otters. And the picture, otter pictured in this photo is Swoosh, named after the Nike Swoosh-shaped scar on his nose. And you can meet Swoosh just about any time from the Embarcadero in Morro Bay. I'm not going to tell you exactly where to find him, but he does tend to rest uh, really, really close to the Embarcadero in some little hidden pockets of the docks. So a little bit about me, since I think you only heard every other word of what Keith said in his introduction. I've spent 20 years working as a sea otter biologist, studying wild sea otters for U.S. Geological Survey, UC Santa Cruz, Monterey Bay Aquarium. I've spent thousands of hours watching sea otters in places such as San Nicolas Island in Southern California, which is going to figure into my talk a little bit later. That's where I did my graduate research and also the more exotic and extremely remote Russian commander islands to right here on the central coast where tracking is a bit less rugged and there's always an espresso less than five minutes away. 
a significant portion of my experience studying sea otters has taken place in San Luis Obispo County and has in fact been based out of Rancho Marino. What I observed in this county and others in California with regards to human disturbance, together with recommendations of a working group of sea otter experts tasked specifically to address this issue, led to the inception of my current work with the uh, directing the nonprofit Sea Otter Savvy. So in spring of 2014, a working group composed of members from California's Southern Sea Otter Research Alliance was formed to address the issue of marine recreation and the sea and sea otter disturbance. Sea Otter Savvy is a product of this working group, most of whom continue to serve as program advisors, and it was conceived as a way to incorporate outreach techniques with a system of good stewardship recognition as a way to recruit the community as active participants in creating a whole new social norm of responsible behavior around wildlife. So you can see our mission statement there, to foster awareness and stewardship on the central California in central California coastal communities and the wildlife viewing public to reduce human sea otter conflict and disturbance and increase an ethic of coexistence. And once again, that was really inspired by a lot of what I witnessed during my time uh, studying wild ta tagged sea otters on the central coast. So let's get oriented in space and time. Here we can see the current range. Uh, of sea otters globally in yellow here on the left side of the screen, the larger uh, map, and the historic range in red. Uh, so that's the, the yellow plus the red equals the historic range. And I've highlighted southern sea otters uh, to the right. The California sea otters current range extends from a little south of Point Conception, right around that elbow of uh, leading to Southern California up to approximately Pigeon Point north of Santa Cruz. And this heat map that you see on the right uh, shows sea otter density. So where it's the reddest, that's where you have the highest densities of sea otters. And the current California sea otter population is approximately 3000 individuals and it's currently listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So really important here is Range Center, which is right smack dab in San Luis Obispo County. Sea otters have been established here the longest, they're at their highest densities, and as a result are competing the most with each other for food. At Range Center, the balance between energy in through feeding and energy out through activity is at its most precarious, and I'm going to really feature this characteristic of slow county sea otters in today's talk. So let me give you a quick overview of sea otter research specific to Slow County. This is in the 21st century, so after 2000, during my time um, conducting, uh, working on research projects, there was some pioneering research done in the decades prior to that by Dr. Kathy Rawls and others, and uh, I am not going to be covering those today, but that is some amazing work, uh, but these are the decades that span my involvement to date. So the range-wide Southern Sea Otter Census occurs annually in May, and that continues to this day. In the in, although in, in the mid uh, 2010s, uh, until the mid 2010s, we did two surveys: one in the spring and one in the fall. The fall was slowly phased out, uh, and now we just do a census in spring, and that ha is the time of year that provides the best accounting for sea otter pups. The ground portion of the census is divided up into sections with section leads, and I've been the lead for the section between San Simeon Point and the radar station, which I saw really clearly in one of Keith's uh, drone photos that is right at the south end of Rancho Marino, and I've been doing that for over 20 years. In 2001, and then in 2001, a tagged otter study, so that's the next one down on the list, was conducted as part of a, the doctoral research of Tim Tinker, then a PhD student of Dr. Jim Estes at UCSC, and now a doctor uh, himself. And it was spatially limited to San Simeon and Cambria. And then study number two in 2012, a second tag sea otter study expanded on the spatial scale of the first, spanning 56 miles of coastline between Piedras Blancas south to Oceano Dunes. That is a lot of territory to cover, if I don't mind saying. I had the privilege of being Rancho Marino's sea otter scientist in residence during that time with the reserve serving as our team's field station. And I was the field um, crew leader for both of these two studies. 
So the work that I'm going to be talking about today, except for that uh, that relates to the census, the counts of sea otters, is really based on work done by uh, researching and tracking tagged sea otters for long term. So we're monitoring tagged otters every single day, trying to locate where they are and learning about what they eat, how well they survive, how they reproduce, and where how they move along the coastline. So we tried to cover that 56 miles of coastline every single day in the second study to try to find all of the otters that were tagged. And you can see in this picture here, uh, our little team down on the coastline. I don't know if any of you recognize this. But this is a Point Bouchon trail just abutting right up to um, the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. And that uh, researcher is tracking, probably doing an activity budget on a tagged uh, instrumented uh, sea otter with a radio transmitter. Rancho Marino, very beautiful and special place to me. Rancho Marino provides, when it's not foggy, which is a significant caveat, optimal conditions for sea otter research with its rocky coastline, elevated bluffs, and mixed giant and bull kelp forest. Uh, whether it's counting sea otters for the census or tracking wild sea otters, I've spent many years becoming familiar with every single cove and every emergent rock. And this is me this year in uh, in spring conducting the range-wide census uh, with my colleague, Michelle Stedler, who's uh, one of the, the um, long-standing sea otter re science researchers in the state. Typically, Rancho Marino is home to a couple dozen otters, but this spring I was able to provide Keith with a high count of 35 plus three pups, despite a low relative percentage of kelp cover. And after 20 years, I've, be I've become pretty familiar with what how the kelp cover variation and what a maximum and minimum looks like. Um, the otter pictured here is one of my favorites from the 2012 study who happened to live right off of the office and the um, reserve uh, UC facilities area where most of the students camp. And you can see her tags there on her hind flippers. She has a pup, obviously you can see that. And uh, she is a snail eater, which is going to feature prominently in one of my upcoming stories. Just had to do a shout out for Don Canestro, who is an amazing friend and facilitator of our sea otter research. He passed away in 2018 and he's much missed but I have really enjoyed working with Keith and he's been super helpful um, in facilitating our research as well so I continue I hope to continue to have many more years coming out to Rancho Marina to count sea otters all right let's start with some stories a tale of two sea otters these are both tagged sea otters from our 2012-2014 study. And let me give you, a, so we're just gonna talk about animals from the, the most prominent stories from animals from that more recent study that really resonated with me and I really felt represented um, the, the plight and the status of sea otters in, along the San Luis Obispo coast. So this photo shows me and a team member, or rather our shadows, on the dunes north of San Simeon Point in 2013, conducting an activity budget, which is 12 hours of continuous monitoring of a focal otter. So don't let anybody tell you that field research is glamorous. <laughs> On the first, uh, and this is on the first tag sea otter featured, the young mom. This young female had a home range just north of San Simeon Point near windsurfing beach called Arroyo Laguna. Many of you are probably familiar or maybe have been there. She was estimated to be three years old at capture. She feeds on medium prey. So a lot of kelp crabs, urchins, mussels, sort of medium sized prey that you would find in a rocky habitat. And typically she's in kelp and usually very close to shore. During the research project, she had a pup at age four. And since she's so young, it's, it's, a, it's very likely that this is either her first, this was either her first pup or among her first. This young female is highly representative of sea otters at the central portion of the range that I highlighted on the map. Having occupied this part of the range for many decades, these sea otters have limited populations 
of their prey and are in competition with one another for food. When contrasted with a population at low density with abundant resources, some key indices of population status, the, the proximity of a population to carrying capacity, the, the maximum number of otters that the resources at a particular location can support begin to emerge. So here, our low density population is San Nicolas Island in Southern California, the site of a translocation in the late 80s and currently the site of a thriving and growing sea otter population. In these figures, San Nicolas Island otters are compared with those from the 2001, so study number one, and this is from a 2008 publication by Tinker et al. These indices have been shown to be highly conserved across numerous sea otter studies. So at the top, we see that energy rates, that's the amount of energy that they are able to take in by foraging is, so we have uh, San Luis Obispo, so slow is the gray column on the left and San Nicolas Island, the low density population with plenty of prey in black on the right. Energy rates are much lower at San Luis Obispo than they are, let me pull this down a little. I think you're actually missing part of that. There we go. Um, second Ooh, there we go um so they're taking in much lower energy per minute in the form of prey the proportion of activity feeding the amount of time so that's that activity budget i was talking about is much higher in san luis obispo than at san nicolas island in fact at san nick they spend a lot of time sleeping and probably the minimum amount of time foraging that they need to do in order to meet their daily energetic demands it's a lot more work to be a sea otter feeding it's uh, along the slow coast and then finally that is reflected by their body condi condition which is re represented here by their mass to length ratio and you can see that that overall ratio is much lower in San Luis Obispo otters than it is in the relatively chubby, if you don't mind me saying, uh, San Nicolas Island otters. So let's see that represented in more graphic form. Um, this, is a, this is the foraging effort trajectory from low at the far left at the low density San Nicolas Island where they're sleeping a lot of the time to the high, high density uh, San Luis Obispo coast with slow falling in at the high end and our young female who ranked at the very highest end of this scale. And this is based on data from two studies, uh, Tometz et al. 2016, Tinker et al. 2008. Body conditions, same kind of wedge, but in reverse. So you have this lower index, this lower mass to length ratio in the poor uh, bony otters of sl the slow coast all the way up to San Nicolas Island at the maximum end. So the, the otters of the slow coast have really helped us, unfortunately, to define what these trajectories look like. Now, if you consider that just merely maintaining oneself is expensive, imagine the increased cost of a reproductive female. Lactation is the most energetically demanding period in a female mammal's life. And for female sea otters, their energetic demands nearly double during lactation and pup care, which you can see in this figure here. So at the far left, we have sort of the baseline um, energy that she needs to get by foraging as she's coming up to the birth of her pup. That's in the gray on the far left. And then as she after the birth of her pup, that amount goes up because she has to put more energy into producing um, milk for lactation. She also has to give some of the prey that she forages to her pup. Uh, and then eventually the pup begins to add to that by finding food on their own. By the time that pup has reached um, the later months uh, before uh, weaning age, the female will have to double her energy intake in order to maintain, to feed her pup, rear her pup successfully, and maintain her own body condition. As a result of this, this collective, it, it results in a collective energy depletion 
and stress that can lead to something known as end lactation syndrome, an overall depleted and vulnerable state in which female sea otters are, are vulnerable to most vulnerable to multiple stressors and threats that they encounter in their habitat. So this is why we're especially focused at Sea Otter Savvy in uh, informing people about the, the at-risk status of mothers with pups or female sea otters in general. So how does this relate to our otter, our young mom? So uh, poor body condition overall, plus her inexperience with rearing a pup equals the loss of this pup recorded during the study period at age 11 weeks. And you can actually see her in the circle here. She's hauled out on the rocks, which is a highly unusual behavior for this particular otter, although hauling out is not necessarily unusual for all sea otters in general. She was found extremely emaciated. She had multiple nose injuries. So as soon as she loses that pup, she comes into estrus and is very attractive to males who hold onto a female during mating by biting their nose. And she alternated between foraging and hauling out either on the beach or on the rocks, as you saw. Her prognosis is grim. Um, and I, unfortunately, this female did not survive to have her second pup, and she died within the course of this particular study. And lactation syndrome affects only adult females and accounted for 23% of re reproductive age female deaths as a primary cause and 58% as a primary or contributing cause of death in a mortality study by Melissa Miller et al. in 2020. Uh, sea otter moms give it all to their pups and sometimes that ultimately leads to their death. So that's really a bummer, I know, but this is really, you know, what the state is for sea otters along the slow coast. They're really struggling to survive. So let's talk about a traveling snail eater and that might perk you up a little bit. While most female sea otters occupy a small single centered home range their entire lives, some like this female keep trackers on their toes by moving back and forth between multiple centers of use. Meet 6641, a prime age female a snail specialist, I'll share more about that in the next slide, who defies that standard for female sea otter home range by traveling comparatively a long distance between centers of use. So she moved between San Simeon, actually north of San Simeon Point, all the way down to inside Morro Bay rafting at Target Rock, and she would inhabit any of the areas within, uh, in between those two spots but most typically would be found at one or the other. And that's a pretty long distance to travel. Now let's look more closely at specialization, what it means to be a snail specialist. As I mentioned, she's a snail specialist with more than 70% of her diet composed of small marine snails like Tegula. So you can see that big pink bar showing that proportion of her diet that were these small marine snails. And she'd catch a few other small things, particularly crabs, um, occasionally, probably incidentally, opportunistically, but for the most part, all she did was eat Tegula. If you're gonna have to eat a quarter of your body weight in these snails, you'd better be able to eat a lot of them efficiently. And that's just what snail specialists do, smashing hundreds of snails in rapid order on a rock anvil on their belly. They will eat hundreds or even thousands of snails in a single foraging bout, sometimes finishing a pile that's stacked on their belly only to roll over and pull out another 20 or so um, from their armpit pockets. So they have to eat a lot. They do it really fast and very efficiently. When walking on the rocky bluffs of slow of the slow coast, listen for that rapid fire cracking characteristic of the snail specialist and look around you for an otter that's doing a lot of rapid fire banging on their belly. One of the key revelations of the comparison between San Nicolas Island and Slow was the differences in overall diet diversity and individual diet, something that can only be revealed in long-term studies of known tagged individuals. When preferred prey are abundant, you'll see most sea otters opting for the same high energy prey. Overall dietary diversity is low and individual diets are very similar to one another. 
uh, as shown here on the left, the panel on the left from San Nicolas Island. So the top two figures in these two graphs are overall diet for these two populations. And then beneath those are sample individual diets, three different individuals showing um, the differences or similarities between the two. When sea otter density is high and prey limited, sea otters expand the overall dietary diversity to include new, less optimal types of prey, like tegula, with individuals occupying the same area coexisting by specializing in small suites of prey that fall into categories. So you may be a specialist on large crabs and abs reaching down into crevices for, to find your prey. You might be a really great digger who digs up clams and worms in a sediment, soft sediment habitat, or like our female here, you might get really good at finding and processing snails, and that's going to be in a rocky habitat. So uh, what you see here is that San Nicolas Island, individual diets really are very similar to the population level diet. All these otters are eating pretty much the same thing. In this case, it's red urchins, optimal prey, easy to find, very abundant. When we go over to the central coast, we see that there's a higher level of diversity. And that's actually measured in these purple bars that you see here on the right side. That's the diversity index. And you can see uh, Shannon Wiener index that indicates that there's a much higher level of dietary diversity overall in the central coast. They're including lots more species. And each individual diet varies from one another. So individuals are specializing usually in a suite of spe specific prey types. And our snail eater might be represented by this middle graph on the right with the snails being that most commonly um, uh, foraged prey, preferred prey item. Uh, and then the green bars here represent the proportion sim proportional similarity index or PSI. And that's the degree, the degree to which each individual diet overlaps with the population diet. And you can see that that's quite low, a lot lower in, on, San Nic or on the central coast than it is for San Nicolas Island. There was a time when, CRC, when researchers, including myself, um, rather looked down on snail specialists as existing on the low rung of the foraging ladder junk food eaters who must be barely scraping by, but data from the 2012 study and others seems to indicate that efficiency is king or queen as male uh, snail specialists are relatively rare and that snail specialists may be more risk prone in their movements due to the risk prone, meaning they're, they're more comfortable moving long distances and, um, and that snail specialists may be excuse me, um, then, then we would predict, they, they're more risk prone than we would predict uh, based on their general, um, based on the general av availability of uh, snail abundance. So my colleague, Michelle Stadler, also found evidence that they are highly successful mothers in her yet unpublished research on sea otter moms, winners and losers. So it turns out they're firmly in the winners category. However, I got to bring in a bummer note uh, snail foraging does present a risk, and this specialist type was found to be at highest risk of infection by the protozoal pathogens, sarcocystis and toxoplasma in Johnson et al. 20, 2009. I like to think of snail specialists like 6641 as the ultimate adapters, and I hope this benefit isn't erased by disease. Since I brought up protozoans, let's talk a little bit about threats from land and sea. I use this beautiful view from above the Natural History Museum in Morro Bay because as a watershed, this area has a high prevalence of disease carried from land to sea otters in the ocean via runoff. So the, this is a figure from Miller 2020 that I just that I mentioned earlier. This is a heat map of the Central California coast showing significant uh, high, that's in red, and low in blue risk, and uh, spatial diamonds and space-time star clusters for select health conditions affecting uh, 560 southern sea otters that were given necropsies and examinations between 1998 and 2012. Um, the color gradient indicates relative mortality risk with the highest red and lowest uh, 
the highest risk in red and the lowest risk in blue. So here I've highlighted uh, the section of coastline depicting San Luis Obispo County to underscore some of the prevalent threats during this time of study. So cardiomyopathy is a heart disease that's strongly associated with that end lactation syndrome and poor body condition I mentioned earlier. Coccidiomycosis is a fungal disease, otherwise known as valley fever. It's a zoonotic disease that can be transferred to and from humans. Toxoplasma and sarcocystis are a couple of nasty protozoal diseases that also infect humans and have really had some hot spots in the Morro Bay uh, and overall slow coast area. Acanthocephalins are some parasitic worms, intestinal worms that I won't talk too much about, but we see some of that incident in Slow County. And then finally, shark bite uh, has a relatively high incident. And I want to point out, these are data uh, that ended at 2012. And I think this would be, uh, there would be more hot spots here, especially in Estero Bay for shark bite mortality and for the two um, protozoal diseases because there have been an increase in prevalence of those uh, in the intervening years. It's important, but what if we dip into the more developed embayments where sea otter habitat meets marine recreation and the other perils of proximity to humans? Harbors like Morro Bay and Port San Luis uh, sea otters are less iconic symbols of the wild coast and more like urban wildlife. They are literally surrounded with boats, recreation craft, commercial craft, buildings, agriculture, golf courses, highways, triathlons, regattas, drones, photographers, and the list goes on. The sea otter savvy focus much of our research and outreach on understanding and mitigating some of the impacts of human proximity. Here are the factors that make sea otters especially vulnerable to human disturbance. They're a recovering species, so they're recovering from near extinction due to the fur trade. They're charismatic. People love them. They are drawn to get closer to them. They're accessible. They're a near shore species and their habitats often overlap with uh, the places that humans like to be. They're particularly vulnerable because they have this high energetic demand and they don't store energy well. So they live paycheck to paycheck and any unnecessary draws on that, pay on that bank account, that energy bank account uh, can be particularly distressing for them. And human behavior, humans tend to do what they wanna do and my job is to encourage, is to change what they want to do. And that is really a major challenge. So you put all these things together and that results in sea otters being especially uh, vulnerable, even among other marine mammal species to human disturbance. Having to repeatedly swim away from encroaching humans is expensive. This is a little bit of a complex figure soup here on the right uh, it includes some results from Sea Otter Savvy's long-term disturbance research across seven sites. So we have a uh, couple sites from Moss Landing, a few from Monterey Bay, and then the two on the far right are both from Morro Bay. They're from two sites where otters hang out and rest in Morro Bay, the Target Rock kelp bed and the, the South Tea Pier. Uh, the top figure indicates disturbance risk uh, on a scale of zero to one, a unitless scale with one being highest. And you can see over here, one of the Morro Bay sites, the T pier site is our highest site for risk of disturbance, but that turns out to not be the end of the story. Um, and then the second figure is the difference between sea otter activity levels at these two sites when stimuli, stimuli being any potential source that might trigger a behavioral change in sea otters is either present or absent. So you can kind of see the differences between these uh, two states here and among the different seven, seven different sites. And finally, the estimated energetic cost of human disturbance for both males in C and females D. And one of the interesting things here is that we have this high risk of disturbance here at the Morro Bay T pier because people are almost always present and nearby. But its impact on their activity state is relatively low or we don't really understand. 
too much about how that it, the interaction between those two things is working. So that's really a focus of future study. It may relate to low level behavior changes and stress and things like that that we really need to take a deeper dive into. So this reflects the cum cumulative cost of chronic disturbance um, above the baseline, uh, which is indicated at, by the red line that you see here at the base of each of these two figures of energetic cost C and D. And it can impact, impact body condition and potentially amplify the effect of other risk factors. Those with bars that are fully above the red line, like right here at Cannery Row in Monterey, uh, have the most significant cost. And the more big tip here, as I said, is a bit of a conundrum. The lesson from their story. Sea otters in Slow County must overcome challenges to survive, particularly females, but males have their stories too. Resources are limited. They are at risk of shark-related mortality, parasitic infection, and lactation syndrome, and urban factors like human disturbance may amplify these risks. And community stewardship is essential I didn't have time to talk too much about that, but if you visit our, our website, Seattle Savvy, or follow us on social media, we talk about that continuously and community engagement is a big part of our strategy. And I'm just gonna play this super quick video that was created by Cal Poly students for our program. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Jenna, very much for an excellent presentation. Um, at this point, I am gonna ask Keith to rejoin us if he can. He's having uh, real issues with his internet on the reserve right now. So he may or may not be able to uh, pop back in and answer a few questions, but um, the first question, actually, Jenna, is for you. What's the average lifespan of otters, male versus females? So males tend to have a shorter lifespan. So, so 10 to 15, 15 year old. In either case, a teenage otter is an old otter, is an aged adult. And then females can live to be as old as 20. When I was, uh, conducting my graduate research at San Nicolas Island, we had one female tagged that um, when she was tagged for my study, they scanned an old a pit tag, like the kind of little um, chip that you put to identify your dog or your cat. And she was from the original translocated population. And so they had real good data on, she was, we count called her founder. It was so cool to have that, that uh, have, located one of those original founding otters and uh by the end of my study she would would have been um 22 years old so that is the oldest known wild sea otter it, it can change obviously in captivity but yeah females tend to live longer even though they have a hard life <laughs> okay and you, you sort of briefly touched on this but some people were interested in whether there were any opportunities for citizen science in these areas? 100%. So Sea Otter Savvy has a robust uh, community science program. And so you can you can visit our seaottersavvy.org website and look for the volunteers section. And there's a, um, a application that you can fill out and all of the data that I showed relative to Sea Otter Savvy was conducted by uh, community scientists, by volunteers in your community. So um, we absolutely rely on them as a small nonprofit to uh, continue to have such a great data set ongoing. Okay. Um, a couple of people wanted to know the uh, website address for Sea Otter Savvy. And um, it's, I believe, www.seaottersavvy.org. Um, I'm willing to bet if you just type Sea Otter Savvy into Google, it will it will find it for you. It should be the first thing that comes up. And if it isn't, I want to hear about it. Yeah, it should be pretty easy to find. Okay. And the same on social media, if you want to follow us, it's at Sea Otter Savvy on all platforms. 
Okay, the next one's for Keith. It looks like Keith's back. Um, someone wanted to know how will the designation of the Chumash Ocean Preserve affect Rancho Marino? And you may want to turn your video um, off and just well, go with audio. Let's see if that helps. Um, as of right now, the proposed one actually leaves the area around the reserve off. Um, and so that would be no effect. Um, the original designation that would include the area around um, Rancho Marino, I don't believe would add much. It would just add one more layer to the offshore area. And we are already within a um, state conservation area. So I, I don't think it would actually change anything very much for the reserve. Okay. Um, we had another question uh, about whether the otters occur on any of the other Channel Islands besides San Nicolas. That's a great question. So they have not become established on any of the other Channel Islands. They periodically, the one that uh, at which otters most reliably will turn up at from time to time is San Miguel. Um, so, but the other islands, not so much. And, um, but as the population is continuing to grow. So at the time of the study that I conducted that I talked about in today's talk, there was about 35 otters there. And today there's about 120. So as that population continues to grow, there'll be more, um, motivation for, for, uh, the males in particular to start leaving and hopefully some of the females to move on and maybe colonize some of the other islands. There's certainly great habitat for them there. Okay. Um, what is your biggest strategy for getting people to care about protecting these otters over just doing what they like in these busy areas? Oh, so that's like a whole hour. I think I actually do a whole hour talk <laughs> on that particular topic because it's so complicated and we're learning every single day. So one of the things that we learned from the pandemic was that people really want to do what they want to do. And it's super hard to change their mind, even in the face of a deadly disease. So, you know, we really try to, one of the things that we really try to do is inspire empathy where we can. So, so, so first of all, we just try to, to promote awareness. So know before you go and know a little bit about sea otters, know about their behavior, know about their natural history. We try to really promote that. That's sort of the bottom line. And then inspiring empathy so that they can understand the plight of these animals, the condition of these females, the precarious nature of their existence, of their pups, which people love. They love the sea otter pups. And so we really try to, to focus on engaging humans as in part of the conservation movement. So you have, if you're out kayaking, you have two options. You can be part of the movement, conserving and protecting and helping sea otters, or you can make their life harder <laughs> and potentially contribute to something really horrible, which I'm sure you wouldn't want, for most cases, wouldn't want to contribute to. And so we, we really try to give people sort of this positive thing that they can do, which, you know, is kind of kind of hard to find in the face of all the conservation, the massive conservation issues that we have today. Like you can do this amazing thing by giving us the outer space. <laughs> and um, so that's one way that we really try to engage people. But there's always going to be people that just it doesn't matter. Um, what message they re they are given they still just want to do their own thing and i just will finally say that we really i really strongly believe that social media is this extremely powerful driver of disturbance um and the urge for people to get close to get a photo or video and so we really try to use that tool for good as much as we we possibly can so it's something for people to keep in mind when they're um monitoring following social media is to kind of avoid that which promotes disturbance uh, to sea otters and other wildlife, because there's a lot of it on there. Okay. How do you determine food selection in individual otters to identify specialists? That is a really great question. Um, so remember I mentioned that the only way we can figure this out is by 
following known otters. So that's tagged otters over long term. So for 13 years of my career, basically what I did every single day of the week was go out, locate tagged otters, and collect foraging data on them. So they have a radio transmitter signal that I hear, and then I see their flipper tags. And then with a high powered telescope, I follow them dive to dive to dive and timing their dives and surface intervals. And for me, this was the best part because I'm a huge marine invertebrate nerd, um, identifying what it is that they're eating. So we try to count how many there are, we measure how estimate how large they are relative to the size of a sea otter's paw, which is kind of cool. And then we try to identify them to the lowest pox possible taxon. And that data set is massive. There are tens of thousands of those dives of unknown sea otters collected over those decades in order to be able to come up with uh, those, so categorizing those specialist types. So it's my favorite thing in the world to do. If it's a beautiful day, I can see what the otter's eating. Um, there is really nothing else I'd rather be doing. It's really nerding out, sea otter nerding out. Okay, here's one. Uh, is an otter capable of swimming from the California coast to the Channel Islands? Well, <laughs> that's a great question because when they did the translocation in the late 80s, uh, the scientists that were uh, conduct researching it at the time and advising that program at the time did not think so. They did not think that sea otters would cross that deep water channel. So there's some deep water. That's why they're called the Channel Islands. There's some deep water channels there. They didn't think sea otters would cross those. But a fair number of the otters that were translocated to San Nicolas Island returned to the places where they were captured on the central coast. And so they're homing. And we don't know how they do that. Nobody knows how they do that. And if you not have an idea for how to study that, <laughs> reach out to somebody because it's a it's a it's a mystery but we do know at this point that's something that has to be carefully considered in any reintroduction program is that sea otters will want to be where they were and they have really powerful instincts to get them back there okay uh i think we have time for maybe one more uh i remember kelp forests were reported disappearing because the urchins were no longer controlled by sea otters. What's the latest on this phenomena? So that's another great question that's also extremely complex. So uh, due to uh, sea star wasting disease in the, started I think in the 2010s, Keith might have a better date than me on that. Um, we lost a lot of sea star species in particular, one that was especially hard to hit was the um, Pycnopodia or sunflower star, which turns out was also a uh, predator of sea urchins. Uh, so sea otters were still around in the central coast. Sea otters were not present north of San Francisco Bay. And so with the loss of that predator, um, some interesting patterns emerged. And I would direct folks to the, the research of Joshua Smith uh, 20, 2020, I want to say, 2020, 2021, 20, looking at this mosaic ecosystem mosaic that resulted. So in areas where sea otters were present, um, urchin barrens still popped up, but they were limited to these patches because sea otters would forage around the edges and limit the expansion of these urchin barrens. Um, and that is a pretty stable state that still hasn't flipped back over. So there's healthy kelp forests that are surrounding these little pockets of urchin barrens where sea otters don't really like to feed, at least in the center of them, but are rather around the boundaries. Um, in Northern California, where we didn't, there weren't sea otters, there was just this massive decimation without that sort of mosaic pattern. So it's just a really complex interaction and a pretty difficult to explain and understand, but uh, the scientists are really getting a great, a better grasp on it every day. Okay, and I think we have time to squeeze in one last one. Um, please tell us about sea otter sleep behavior, how many hours, when, et cetera. Oh, I love that question. Um, so sea otters are on a 24 hour clock. They are neither diurnal nor nocturnal. So they, and we know this, how? 
from those radio transmitters so and those activity budgets. So I mentioned the 12 hours. We would sometimes do 24 hours in shifts. And so we would listen to that signal in the dark, and that would tell us whether they were foraging or resting or active but not foraging. And so we we're able to determine from those data and later on for more advanced technology that they feed both day, feed or rest both day and night. And um, they sleep probably eight to 12 hours a day, 10 to 12 hours a day. Um, like I said, at San Nicolas Island, where prey resources were abundant, they slept a lot. In fact, it was a challenge getting foraging data on them because they were sleeping so much. So it probably kind of told us like this is the minimum number of foraging, minimum amount of foraging that a sea otter has to do to get its daily caloric requirement. And this is how much sleep they will do. And every time uh, they have to spend more time foraging as we get closer to carrying capacity, they have to borrow from that sleep time. And we all know how that works in terms of work versus sleep. It's We like to keep as much sleep as possible. Okay, well, I'm afraid our time is up and um, we still had a lot of unanswered questions. So uh, if you have questions, I'm going to direct you to the seaotterstavvy.org website. Um, I believe there's contact information on there and um, you can send an email and hopefully Jenna can get back to you with an answer. There, there were quite a few emails about people who were eager to volunteer. So, yay! <laughs> Uh, so with that, I'm going to thank uh, our speakers for tonight, Jenna and Keith. Uh, I'm sorry we had some internet difficulties, but uh, as I said in the chat, when you live on a reserve, um, internet's not always stable. It's just one of those things we have to live with. Uh, I encourage everybody to come back next Wednesday night at 7. Um, our presentation will be hosted by the... Uh, Eastern Sierra Reserve, Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserve. Um, so please join us for that. Uh, this video was recorded and we will post it and upload it to the UCSB NRS YouTube channel. And um, I'm gonna end tonight by throwing up a slide uh, and sharing that that has all of the information on it that you need to find the uh, YouTube channel. But uh, when in doubt, just uh, go into YouTube and click on the little magnifying glass and type UCSB NRS into the search box there and we're the first thing that will will pop up. So again, thank you uh, Jenna and thank you Keith and thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you next Wednesday.